Okay, so this week I'm going to continue on from the stuff I did in the last tutorial, uh, week three. So as usual, I've got some notes up uh, on my website, dave.if90.net, cabby216 tutorials, week five. Okay, so we skipped week four, we didn't have a class last week. Now, if you'll recall where we essentially got to last week, the test theme that I was working on looked like this. Okay, so I'd taken a static HTML and CSS file and I'd started to remove some of the, the dummy content in there and replace it with some PHP code uh, so that it dynamically put the, the data that WordPress stores in its database output in my, uh, in my uh, WordPress theme. So as it stands now, uh, we have, so just to recap, what we did was we hooked up the style sheet. So we used the PHP call to, to point the style sheet to the right place. And then we used the WordPress loop to output uh, the post that we have. And at the moment, we only have the two posts. Okay, and we did a couple of other things like linking the logo to the home page. And, and that was about as far as we got. So I'm going to continue on from this point and add a few more things and by the end of today uh, I think you should have most of the fundamentals uh, demonstrated that I think you'll need to basically finish off your, your website. So there is a link to the, the static files for this again if you do want to download and follow along. Um, but I'm going to, uh, as usual, kind of... I've probably think you don't necessarily need to follow along and type the code as I do it. I'm going to need to go fairly fast to get through it all. So if you just um, follow along what I'm doing and, and make notes, and as usual, I'm screen recording this so you can go back at any time and have a look at what I do. But really, I'm interested in demonstrating the types of things that you want to do uh, and how you do them rather than getting into anything specific to do with what you might want to do for your particular website just yet. Okay, so the first, so I'm really going to focus on this post here, the tutorial week five outline. The first thing I want to talk about is <clears throat> some useful plugins for uh, generating test content for your website. So developing a WordPress website is a bit of a chicken and the egg thing. You need a theme to display the content, but then you need some content to display the theme. So what we've been doing so far is going back and forth, but we've been doing a little bit of, of creating the theme and then we've been adding some, some uh, dummy content into some posts. But there's uh, some, you can get some useful plugins to just give you a bunch of posts to test your themes with uh, as, as you're developing it. So I've got a link here to one called WP uh, Example Content, which will essentially you install it and activate it and it will generate a bunch of posts of various different types. So I'm going to install that first of all. Now there's there's essentially two ways that you can uh, install a plugin. So I might demonstrate both of these ways. Okay, so let me just... Okay, so I'm going to log into the admin section of my website. Actually, I'll do this in Chrome. Okay, so this is the admin section of my website. Sorry, <laughs> wrong one. Got too many websites. Okay, this is the admin section of my development website. Okay, and on the left here as part of the menus, you'll see a section called plugins. And if you click on that, you'll see that there's a couple of plugins pre-installed by default. Okay, there's one that's uh, a spam filter for your comments and then there's another one that's essentially a nothing, nothing plugin, it's just to demonstrate how to have a plugin. 
So you can add new plugins in one of two ways. You can do it through the, the admin interface. I can click on this add new button here. And I can search from uh, search for plugins through here. So I can say example content. Okay, and it will come up with a list of uh, plugins. Now these are all essentially sourced from the WordPress.org's uh, plugins page. So whether you're browsing them on the WordPress website or you're searching them through your back end, you're essentially searching the same list of plugins. So this is the one I was talking about, the WP example content. Uh, you can click and look at the details of it and you'll notice that if I do that in the website here, uh, the description, okay, is the same. It's getting all the same content. And uh, I can click on install now from here. Or I can just click on install now from here. Okay, and it will ask me if I want to install it. I go okay. Now with this method, installing through the admin interface, what it will normally do here is ask you for the FTP details to your web server. So if your web server allows this, um, sometimes it won't, but most of the time it will. You can put in the account details to your FTP server and WordPress will download it and upload it to your web server automatically without you actually having to download those files to your computer first. Okay, so you can see in this case that has worked. So it's installed the plugin for me and what you'll notice is if I look at the uh, directory for my website, Okay, so there's the, the root folder for my WordPress installation. The plugins live in a folder under WP content and then plugins. So you'll notice that there's the existing ones that were there and it's also added now a folder for that plugin that I just installed. So if your if your uh, web server doesn't allow you to doesn't allow WordPress to upload the plugins automatically uh, through FTP, then actually adding a plugin to your website is as simple as downloading the plugin and uh, extracting the folder to this plugins folder and then uploading that to your web server. Okay, so there's nothing really magical going on about about that that. In installation process, it's essentially just putting those files and folders in that uh, plugins folder inside your WordPress installation. So as soon as you have that there, if you go back to the plugins page, okay, you'll notice that there's that plugin that I have just installed. So I'll just demonstrate the alternate way of doing that with another plugin. <coughs> Okay, so I've got linked to another another plugin here which I find really useful, not just for development, but while I'm running my blog as well. It's called the Duplicate Post plugin. Because when you're creating posts, a post that you're going to create is probably very similar to another post that you've already created. So you can save a lot of time by simply duplicating a post and then modifying what's changed rather than putting everything in again from scratch. So that's where this Duplicate Post plugin can be useful. And so I'll install this the alternate way of just downloading the files and then putting them on my web server uh, under the plugins folder. Okay, so I'm going to download it here. You'll notice that it downloads as a zip file. Okay, there it is. And all I'm going to do is extract that. Okay, to a folder. And then I'm simply going to... Just go back to my root directory so we can see where I am. I'm simply going to upload it to my WP content uh, and plugins folder. Just put that in the wrong place. Let's try that again. Okay, there it is, duplicate post. And now that that's there, uh, I can go back to the admin section of my website and refresh and there's the duplicate post plugin. Okay, so they're the two ways that you can install plugins. Either way, the first method is really just doing some of the steps for you. 
uh, it's downloading a zip file, extracting it and uploading it to your server. Um, but as soon as the files are there in that plugin folder, it will recognize the plugin and it will, should appear in this window. Now the other thing you have to do is you can have active and inactive plugins. So you can have plugins installed, um, but you can have them as inactive. So you, you may have a bunch of plugins and you may not want one, you not, may not want to use one for a little bit, uh, but rather than uninstalling it because you might want to use it later, you can deactivate it. So by default, when you install a new plugin, it doesn't usually activate by itself. So you have to make sure you come in here to the plugin section and click on activate. So I'll activate both of these. I'll activate the duplicate post plugin, tells me it's activated, and I'll activate the example content plugin. And as soon as I do this, okay, you'll notice that this new uh, section has come down here. Now, the way that you configure plugins can vary from plugin to plugin. Sometimes they have uh, a, a link to the settings from the plugin page here, like this duplicate post one. Sometimes they'll put their settings in the settings menu over here, and other times, like for example, this WP example content plugin, it will actually create a new menu over here. Okay, so that varies a little bit and can be a little bit annoying because sometimes you have to sift through to see where the settings are, but that information should be in the details on the plugin page when you go to download it anyway. Okay, so the WP example content plugin is the one I'm particularly interested in right now. I'm going to click on that here. And essentially it's got uh, two buttons, one to add a bunch of posts to your database and another one to remove it. So if we just quickly go and look at my posts, okay, I can see there's just the two posts there. There's the Hello World one and then that second post that I created by myself. And then if I look at pages, again, there's only the initial sample page included with WordPress there. So as soon as I come back to this example content and I click on this add bundle of sample post button, okay, it tells me that the posts added. And if I click, keep clicking on that, it will add those posts again and again and again. So if I want lots and lots of content, I can keep clicking that. Now, obviously, once I've finished my site, I'm probably not going to want this random posts with nonsense text in it to still be there so I've also got the remove all sample post button there once I'm done with the testing and I don't want those posts anymore. So if I go back now and have a look at the posts, okay you can see that it's added a bunch of things. So the idea of these posts is that they contain all or most of the different kinds of HTML and uh, HTML markup that you might be likely to put within a post so that you can test that your theme, your CSS caters for laying out all, all of those different types of HTML. So for example, if we look at this post, okay, it's simply a bunch of lorem ipsum text with some uh, unordered and ordered lists. Okay, and the various other posts have other things. There's an image post. Okay, which contains an image to make sure that your theme deals with laying out images. Uh, and I don't, know, I don't know how much detail we went into looking at the post editing, but uh, you'll notice that the post editing has both visual and HTML, so you can edit the post both ways. Okay, and just to show... Uh, Just to show what the uh, duplicate post has done is you'll notice now that in any of these uh, any of these posts here, if I hover over, there's a new option that uh, I don't think was there before that uh, says clone where I can create a, a duplicate of this item. So let's say I wanted to create another post with an image in it and I've set that post up in a certain way rather than creating a new one from scratch. Okay, I can just create a new one and then go in and edit that. Okay, but I will delete that for the moment. Okay, but the duplicate post plugin is probably actually more useful when you actually start adding uh, real content. Okay, so let's see what the front end of the website looks like now that I've got that example content in there. Okay, so as you can see, it's now listing uh, a whole bunch of, well, essentially all of those posts there. Okay, so there's the two that I initially had, and because they're listing in reverse chronological order, the ones that I've just added, the example posts, okay, you can see I added above, 
So we've got multiple paragraphs, image post, unordered and ordered lists, a block quote, uh, a links post, okay, which I guess is just a bunch of links to make sure you're styling your links correctly, uh, and then uh, a headings post to test all of your headings at various different levels. So this is quite useful for testing that your CSS styles essentially cover everything that you might eventually all the con types of content that you might eventually put in, in, in your blog posts. Okay, so, so now I've got some content in there, it's going to be a bit easier to demonstrate uh, how my theme works and also see where it's going to break if it is going to break. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, creating a widgetized sidebar. So last week we didn't we got as far as separating the sidebar template file from the rest of the theme, but we still have sort of static content in there. So if I look at my sidebar.php file, okay, there it is, and it's, it's still just the, the dummy content that I put in there when I was creating my initial uh, static HTML and CSS layout. So what we can actually do is uh, WordPress has uh, a specific type of plugin called widgets, which allow you to add little bits of dynamic content through a drag and drop interface in the back end. Okay, so again, this is allowing the user to add and remove content without actually having them go in and modify the code. So if I look in uh, my WordPress back end again here, and I go to uh, appearance, so appearance is the same place where we uh, had the theme, where we installed the theme last week. Uh, there's also a sub-menu there called widgets. Okay, and if I go to there, what it tells me, uh, first of all, is that I have no sidebars defined. So what I need, first of all, if I want to actually use widgets in my theme, is I need to uh, set up the theme to have widget-defined areas that uh, I can put the widgets in. So I have a link here to uh, the WordPress site about uh, widgetizing themes. So essentially, this is what this is what that widget screen should look like if our theme is able to take widgets. So that's what we're looking for there. So let's just open up that link and have a quick look. Okay, so basically this. I won't bother going through this entire article, but it talks about how you set up your theme to allow uh, widgetized sidebars or, or widgetized regions of your template. And okay, one of the first things it tells us is that we have to put some code in a new file called functions.php to tell WordPress that we're going to have a, uh, a widgetized sidebar area. So the first thing I'm going to do is create that functions.php file. So I think I briefly touched on the functions.php file in, in my lecture a couple of weeks ago. Essentially, the functions file is a part, it is a file where you have all of the other bits of code in your WordPress theme that go that aren't specifically outputting stuff in the template. So it's just a place where you can put other code that you can refer to from any other template file. So I'm going to create a new file inside of here called functions.php. Okay, and if we look at a theme like 2011, you'll notice that their functions.php file is huge. Okay, they've got lots and lots of extra stuff. But essentially, this is where you this is where you put uh, uh, either helper helper code or code that sets up. Uh, plugins and, and, and widgets and things like that. So we won't go through the 2011 one because that might be a bit overwhelming. But essentially our functions.php file just starts as an empty PHP file. Okay, And then anytime you're looking at something which says add this to the functions.php file, there's a lot of stuff that you can actually just copy and paste in here. And the ordering, the ordering of things in here is not really important. Unless it's specifically, unless you're specifically reading something that tells you that it has to be in a particular order, 
So the order that I paste things in here um, doesn't necessarily have to be the order you do it in, um, but I'll talk about that more uh, in a little bit. So my functions.php file is empty right now, and I'm just going to demonstrate the simplest case. So we can actually register multiple different widgetized areas around our page. So I could have a widgetized sidebar and a widgetized footer and a widgetized header and maybe another widgetized sidebar on the other side. But I'm just going to demonstrate the simplest case of we're just registering one widgetized area being my left sidebar and then we're going to add some widgets to that. So the simplest thing that you the simplest case scenario, all you have to do is in your functions.php file type uh, register sidebar. Okay, and if we're registering multiple sidebars, here's where I could give them different names. But I'm just going to do one to start with. And if I go back to... my admin section and I refresh this. Okay, so all I've done since I last refreshed this page was created my functions.php file and added that PHP code register underscore sidebar. Okay, and now as part of WordPress's loading, it looks for that functions.php file. It, it sees that, that call to register sidebar and goes, okay, you've registered one uh, widgetized area. So you can see that the sidebar over here is by default called sidebar one, because I haven't given it a name, but I don't really care about that. And if I go back to my uh, functions.php file and I register another sidebar, come back and refresh, okay, you'll see I get sidebar two. Okay, so you can essentially add as many widgetized areas as you want, and although they're called sidebars because the original intention for them was to be a sidebar. You can actually lay it out in any part of the template you want. So there's nothing to stop you from, from outputting widgets in your footer or even in the main body content. Um, but the original intention and the most common, common thing is to have, uh, is to have um, the widgets in, in an actual sidebar. Okay, so... I'm going to get rid of some of these. Okay, so the, these are ones I actually created earlier, but I'm gonna I'm gonna recreate them. So I'll just delete this for now. So I want to show you the sorts of things that you can do with the widgets. Um, you can you can if you want to actually give your sidebars different names. Uh, if you look in, in this um, page on widgetizing themes, it will um, you can see you can actually call register sidebar with more um, with more arguments. And so you can do things like say insert this code before and after widgets and, and call it this and so forth. Yeah. So I'm just gonna demonstrate the simple case first, but if you do want to look into more of that stuff then um, yeah, this would be that link would be the place to find that stuff out. Okay, so all right, so let's just go back to having one sidebar for now. Just keep it simple. Okay, there's my sidebar one, and it's an empty sidebar. Um, and essentially you have these widgets here, okay, and you can just drag and drop them to and from the sidebar. So for example, I can drag a calendar over here, and it has a bunch of built-in widgets, but you can also download uh, widgets just like you would download any other plugin as well. So if you download a widget plugin and activate it, you should see that it comes up here as an option to add as well. Uh, so one of the built-in ones is a calendar. And I'll use this just to demonstrate first of all, uh, I'll give it a title. Okay, and so now I've registered a, a sidebar, a widgetized sidebar, and I've got one widget in it, but I'm not quite done yet. If I refresh my page, okay, it's still outputting what it used to. So 
the second part of this equation is in my sidebar.php file, I actually have to tell it to output uh, a output my, my dynamic sidebar. So again, if we refer back to this page, uh, okay, it talks about the sidebar.php markup to output the output the sidebar itself. Now, this actually has a bit of extra code which uh, is not entirely necessary. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain what the rest of it is for a moment. But actually, the only thing you really need to output this uh, dynamic sidebar is a single call to this dynamic underscore sidebar function. And I put that inside of my I put that inside of my sidebar .php file, essentially wherever I want the dynamic sidebar to output. So let's say I want it to output straight underneath my uh, sidebar heading then I just put PHP uh, code in here and I write dynamic underscore sidebar. Okay, and this is where if I had multiple sidebars, I could tell it which sidebar to output. So I could put a number in here like one, two, three, up to however many sidebars that I have. But if I just have one sidebar, then I don't need to specify it. Okay, it's just gonna go and get the first sidebar that I've created. Okay, so that's in there. And if I refresh my page now, what you should see is any of the widgets that I've assigned to the sidebar output where I essentially underneath that sidebar heading there. And at the moment, I just have a calendar there, so hopefully you should see calendar appear. Okay, there we go. Okay, so that calendar widget, so you think of widgets like, well, I mean, you have widgets elsewhere as well. You think of like, uh, the widgets that you might have on your phone or a, or on sort of like a Google home page might have a weather widget okay they're self-contained little bits of code that output something and and with this interface depending on where you drag them uh, determines where it outputs okay so this this one outputs a calendar with uh, links on the days where you actually have posts so for example I can click on this 8th of August here okay which was when, the, that, when I did that last tutorial, and I can see that there are the posts that were published on that particular date. So now that we can see that working, oh, I should briefly explain. So this extra stuff here is essentially sort of foul safe code. So there's an if statement here, which is basically saying, if not dynamic sidebar, then do some other stuff. So what this is essentially saying, and you can you can write it this way if you want. What this is saying is, well, if there are no sidebars registered, then output something else. So we're not outputting nothing. But I can't really think of a scenario where you're going to have be outputting a dynamic sidebar in your theme, but not have actually registered one. Um, so feel free to add that extra code if you want. But really, functionality-wise, all you need to have is this dynamic sidebar um, call here. And I think it's beneficial to keep the examples simple for now um, so that, you know, they're not, not so overwhelming. But this, this is an, in, in yours as well. As long as you have the dynamic sidebar registered, that will output there. Otherwise, it will output nothing. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's go back to our widgets page. And I can add some other stuff. Now, there's a widget called the text widget, which is a lot more useful than it initially seems because, well, first of all, we can do something really boring with it, like I might just do an about me. Okay, and just put a little, little about me thing in there. Close that up. Okay, and refresh. Okay, and there's my there's my little about me widget. And if I decide I don't like the order of those, maybe I want the calendar to come first and the about me to come second, then I can just drag them and they relay out like that. Okay, so again, this is all about 
creating ways so that the user can modify the content and modify the layout without ever having to go back and modify the theme themselves. Now, the other cool thing that we can do with the uh, text widget is we can actually put any HTML in there that we want. And we can put JavaScript in there if we want as well. So, for example, let's say I want to output my Twitter feed as part of my website. Now, I could probably go and download uh, a Twitter widget plugin that would do it for me, um, and that's fine. But for the purposes of demonstrating this, what I can also do is, okay, so I know there's a place on Twitter where I can go and it will allow me to generate code to output a Twitter widget for my feed on either Facebook or my website. So I just Googled that and I'm going to click on the My Website and I've got some different options for the Twitter widgets. I'm going to grab the profile widget so that I can have on my website. If someone's coming to my website, they can see the stuff that I'm posting on uh, Twitter as well. Okay, and then I can customize various different things like should I poll for new results and scroll bar and yeah, that looks about right. Let's maybe change that color. And dimensions, let's make that auto width. I get a preview there. So essentially I want this to output on my site. So I'm gonna hit finish and grab code. Okay, and you'll notice this is essentially uh, a JavaScript there. Now I can copy and paste this JavaScript into my text widget. Okay, because it will accept any text, HTML, or JavaScript. And I can paste that in there. Okay, and hit save. Okay, and let's put that, let me put the about me and then the Twitter feed after that. Hit refresh. And let me just see if my internet is working. Always does this to me when I'm demonstrating a Twitter widget. Anyway, take my word for it that that's worked, and hopefully that will, before the end of the class, start actually showing results. Okay, but that's what you that's what you can do. You can you can have any bit of uh, you can have any bit of HTML that you want and put it inside a widget there and output it like that. If you wanted, you could embed a uh, YouTube video in the exact same way. Um, so your possibilities are are pretty unlimited with using that text and HTML widget. Uh, okay, let's see now. The other thing I want to change, and it's not so obvious what's gone wrong here because I actually changed the CSS a little bit, but if I inspect this with Firebug, okay, you'll notice that my, my sidebar itself is a div, but that it's outputting each of these widgets as a list item. Okay, so that's the default way of outputting the widgets. Now you can, again, if you want to look into it, uh, this this page on Wikipedia themes is a place to look. Uh, you can, when you're registering the sidebar, tell it to uh, output different things before and after the widget. Because we've left it blank, the default thing to do is output each widget as a list item. But if you'd rather output them as divs, then I'd suggest reading the documentation on the register sidebar method, and it will tell you what you need to put uh, between here. But having said that, I, I think there's nothing wrong with outputting the widgets as, as list items. That's probably the way semantically that makes the most sense. But all that it means is that I should change my sidebar from a div to an unordered list so that the list items uh, underneath here are semantically correct. So you can see you can see I've already put in the style here which has 
has set the list style type to none. So if I hadn't done that already, you'd notice that the, the list items get output with little dots beside them. Okay, but that's easy enough to fix by just setting the list style type of the sidebar list items to none. So I'm just going to go, so even though it looks right, I'm just going to go in and just to make it semantically correct, I'm going to change my sidebar from being a div to being an unordered list. Okay, and now that's semantically correct, and it looks the same. Um, and the only other thing I've done uh, to this CSS there is add a, a bottom border to, the, to each widget to separate them, to visually separate them a little bit. So if I disable that style, you'll see that they just kind of output one after the other. That's the only other thing that I changed from there. So now that I've got that in there, I really don't need this other content that I just had there to fill out the section. So I may as well go and delete this stuff. Okay, so all I really want there outputting is my the dynamic part of my sidebar, the widgets. And the only other widget I might add just for now is Actually, no, I'll add a couple more. Uh, there's one here, the meta widget. Okay, and that, um, and if some of these widgets, if you leave the title blank, I think it will just give you a default title. So you see how that works. So the meta widget, you'll probably notice from the, the default theme, gives you links to, to, for example, the login. And if you are logged into the admin section, and then various other links that might be useful. So you can, for example, uh, as you can see here, it gives you a link to the RSS feed of your content. So as I think I mentioned uh, previously, one of the nice things that having a CMS does is that you can automatically generate this RSS feed for you. So if you have readers of your blog who want to subscribe to your uh, your blog posts in their RSS reader, then you've already got that option for them. You just give them that link uh, to your RSS feed. And then the last one I'll put in is the search widget. Put that up the top. Okay, and here we can actually search for things as well. So let me just find a post that might. Okay, let's say I want to search for a block quote. So I know that's in a post. Okay, again, without actually having to do anything, okay, the search functionality is already <laughs> built in there for me. It's just going to go through and any, <clears throat> any post or page that has there's those search terms in it, it's going to present for me. Okay, and we get this all for free because it's built into the CMS. We don't have to go through and write our own search function. Uh, I could search for that hello world page. Okay, and there we go, I get that first default hello world post there as well. <clears throat> now, all of these widgets are stylable. Uh, again, if you look in, if you look with Firebug at these, okay, you can see that all of the all of the widgets are output with different IDs and different classes. So in order to style these, all you, all you need to do is figure out what IDs and what classes are applied to the various widgets and the various parts of the widgets, and then you just go into your style.css and write styles for those, and, and they'll be applied. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, that's. I'll probably leave the, the widgetized uh, sidebar stuff there. Again, if you want to go into something more complex than that, have multiple widgetized areas um, or, or specify more specifically how the widgets themselves are actually output, you'll find that information on this link. 
but also, I mean, if you re if that's something you really want to do for your template, I'm happy to kind of talk you through that as well later on. But uh, I think that's enough to go over that base case example there. Um, and so just to recap that, all we needed to do was create a functions.php file. Uh, inside of that, say, register sidebar, which then allowed us in our admin section to get this widgets interface where we could drag and drop to the sidebar. And then in our sidebar.php file, uh, make a PHP call to dynamic sidebar to output that dynamic sidebar, and then that was it. Okay, so those those are the, the essentially the three steps that you need to take uh, to implement widgetized uh, a widgetized sidebar in your theme. Okay, the next thing I will talk about is implementing user customizable menus. So. Our, or my test theme still only has this, um, this default menu that doesn't actually do anything. Okay, it's just text there to test that my layout actually works. Okay, but what I really want to do is be able to have menu items that link to posts and pages and categories and whatever other content I have uh, in my CMS. Now, the way that you used to do this was actually to specifically make calls to output all of your pages and output all of your categories. But as of about WordPress version 3, they've implemented a much more flexible menu system. So if you're looking at older tutorials, this kind of stuff probably won't be in it. But but I'd strongly suggest that this is the, the best way to implement menus in your theme. So, uh, so what I'll do first of all is again in my admin section go down to uh, menus okay and again it's telling me that the current theme is not made of these port menus but I can use custom menu widget to add menus I create here to the theme sidebar so there is some setup that I have to do to fully implement this as well but uh, what I might do first of all is just show you that, so there's two ways, there's two ways of outputting a custom menu uh, on your page. The first way is one of the widgets is a custom menu widget. So if I drag this here, I can actually select one of the menus I've created and output that as a widget. Okay, and it's telling me that no menus have been created yet, so I obviously have to go and create a menu. So I'll go back to the menus page. Okay, and I'll create a menu, and let's just call this one, uh, let's call this a uh, sidebar. Okay, and what I get now is essentially a list of all of my pages and all of my categories, and also, I have the ability to add any custom URL that I want as well. So, uh, let's just start by adding um, a couple of links to these pages and maybe a parent, child and grandchild page as well. So when we create pages, you can actually specify uh, parent and child pages. So you can create some sort of hierarchy like that, and you can reflect reflect that in, in the menu structure as well. So I'm just going to select these pages and click Add to Menu. Okay, and you can see that they appear over here. And by default, the menu names are going to output as the title of the pages, which seems logical enough. Uh, if you want to change that, you can, you can change the navigation label here. Uh, I'm just going to leave them as their defaults, but what I do want to show you is, well, let's just actually, let's just see what this looks like if I do this first of all. So I'll save this menu, okay, that's saved now, I'll go back to my widget screen, there's my custom menu widget, and let's put that about there, let's get 
paste to output it. Okay, and it asked me to select a menu. I've only got one menu so far, so it's selected that by default for me. So the sidebar menu, I'll save that, go back and refresh my page. Ah, and my Twitter feed is working. Okay, so here's the output here. Maybe it will be useful to put a title there for that as well. Okay, I actually think the menu should probably go more towards the top of that. Okay, there's my menu there. So I've got my navigation is now kind of contained together. I've got searching and I've got my menu here as well. Now, if we inspect this with Firebug, you'll see again, because this is kind of the, the, uh, the way that you output menus is, is as unordered list. Okay, that's just the way that you do it to be semantically correct. Again, it's done it like this. So it's output a bunch of divs to contain that menu and then also a bunch of list items with links and you'll see that the links all, okay, they all link to essentially the, the page ID and the page IDs will all be different. So we did touch on this a little bit last time is the way that WordPress figures out the resource that you want is by looking at the URL. So if I'm going to click on one of these links, the headers page, you can see down the bottom left, if you can actually read that, that it's going to, I oh, will see it when I click it, okay? The URL up here has asked for, has, has passed WordPress this, uh, this parameter saying page ID equals 69. Okay, and if I want to confirm that, uh, I can go into my pages. I don't know if it will tell me the IDs here, but if I were to look in the database, I'd see that somewhere there was a reference to say that that page with that content in it had an ID of 69. Okay, and there it is. There's the headers page with the content and the links page as well. Image page, child page, grandchild page. Okay, so now again, I could have, I could have, uh, written that code in manually, okay, and, and that might still work, but by doing it this way, I can, again, have a nice interface where I can drag and drop things. If I rename the page uh, and it gets saved with a new ID, it's automatically updated. I don't have to update uh, manually the menu. So this is just a much nicer way of managing the content. Now, the one thing I did want to show you was Logically, this doesn't make much sense. If this is meant to be, this child page and grandchild page are meant to be hierarchically contained under this, then uh, then it makes sense to sort of have it appear visually like that. So we can manage that using the menu interface. Okay, if I grab any of these, I can actually drag them to reorder them, but I can also drag them left and right so that they exist in a hierarchy underneath another menu. Okay, so you can see now that my image page being the parent page has the child page contained underneath it and the grandchild page contained underneath that. So I can save that menu again and refresh. Okay, and you can see that it's automatically now changed this HTML output to have sub lists underneath the parent list to to demonstrate what's a, a child menu of of another menu item and being being output this way we can style this with css any way that we want so we could we could style this so that it's a hover over drop down menu it doesn't have to be a a, a bland uh, unordered list like this as a menu and i'll demonstrate that by also outputting this menu up here, but styling it in a particular way. So I'll leave that one there for now. So that's how we add a menu through a widget. And what I'm gonna show you now is the other way of uh, adding a menu, which is similar to the way that we output the dynamic sidebar. We register a, we register a, uh, a menu location with our theme, and then we can put a, a 
uh, function call inside part, inside part of our theme file to output a particular menu. So, first of all, I'll create, let's create another menu to start with. And we'll call this one main. Okay, and I'm just going to add everything to this. Add to menu. Okay, and let's set this hierarchy up again. Okay, there we go. So that's a menu with all of my pages essentially. And just as an aside, you'll notice you can select an option here to automatically add new top level pages to the menu when you create them. So if you want any time you create a menu for that, any time you create a new page for that automatically to be added to the menu, you can check that and then it will automatically add a new page to the menu without you having to come back and manually add it here. So that may or may not be something that's useful uh, for you, but that option's there if you need it. Okay, and I guess just before I go and output this the other way, I'll just demonstrate that I should now in my custom menu have the option to output either of those two menus. Okay, so I can create as many menus as I like. I don't even have to have them output anywhere. I can just have them saved in the back end. Okay, and then I can output this, and that should now output okay, the new menu. So I'll switch that back for now. Because what I want to do is output that, that main menu here uh, up in my header section. Okay, so now in the header section, I don't have my header section defined as a widgetized area, so I obviously can't drag a custom menu to be output up there without first defining it as a widgetized area. But what I can do is, is use a call to output that menu anywhere in my template that I like, but I have to do a little bit of setup first of all. So you'll notice here in the menu section that is a part that talks about theme locations, and it says the current theme does not natively support menus, blah, 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 blah. So the way that we allow it to natively support menus is, again, to go, well, actually I'll... I'll reference the I'll reference the WordPress section on this. Sorry, not that one. This one. If you want if you want a good step by step tutorial on this stuff, by the way, this second link here is really good. It was written just after the time that this got implemented, but it takes you through with really good screenshots and, and instructions on on how to do all this stuff. Um, so that's definitely worth a look at, that second link on implementing customizable menus. Okay, but then there's also the WordPress one, which talks about it as well in a little bit less detail. Actually, this one might not even mention it at all, so I'll go back to the second one. So as part of this one, it talks about registering a menu for a theme or a theme location. Okay, and so it talks about this function called register nav menu or register nav menus if you want to register multiple ones. Okay, and generally what we do, so this is this is the part that we're we're going to do here, is we register a we register a menu and we give it a name which refers to the theme location. So what we'll end up is having a bunch of theme locations and then we can link different menus to those locations to output them. So it may seem a little bit convoluted, but uh, it, it, it makes it makes it fairly very flexible in the end. Okay, but this is essentially what we're going to do. We're going to go back to our functions.php file. Okay, and this is where I was talking about the order. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter if I register my menu before my sidebar or the other way around. Okay, because they have no bearing on one another, but I'm just going to put it here just, just because. Okay, and I'm going to call the register nav menu function. Okay, and...
okay? And it takes two parameters, and they both look like names, but they're both used for slightly different things. So the first parameter is a string, so I'm putting it in inverted commas, and I'm going to call it. So assuming that I created multiple menus, I could call my menu areas primary, primary, secondary, tertiary, okay, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to call this one my primary menu. And I give it a second name, okay, which looks pretty much exactly the same. The only difference, so like that, the only difference is this needs to be this needs to be one full word because this is how it's going to be referred to uh, in code. And this here is just a label that gets presented to the user in the, the back end interface. Okay, but really it doesn't matter what you name these, as long as you remember what they are. And as soon as we do that, that we've registered a theme location. So I'll go back to the menu section and refresh. Okay, and you can see now that saying that my theme supports one menu. So select which menu I'd like to use for a particular menu location. Okay, so I could output, so anywhere in my code where I tell it to output a primary menu, I could, I could link any of my other menus to that menu location. So I could link sidebar or main. Okay, and what I'm going to do is link my main menu, save that. Okay, and Okay, now I need to go to the part of my template which actually outputs that menu, that, that, um, that menu. So that's going to be in my header.php file. Okay, there's my placeholder menu there. And I'm going to get rid of that. And instead, I'm going to, inside of PHP, say, uh, use a function called wp underscore nav uh, underscore menu. Okay, and here again, if I want to take this to a more complex example, if I'd registered multiple menu locations, then as part of the parameters here, that's where I specify which, uh, which menu location I want to output there. So that's all detailed nicely in uh, this link here. Okay, so you can see the difference between the base case WP nav menu, which just outputs the first menu location that you've created. Okay, but then there's also a slightly more complex way of doing this, which is sending it a array with theme location and pointing to the 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 theme location that you created for that menu. So we'll put in that there as well. And I'd suggest doing it this way because of all the things that you're likely to have multiples of, then a menu is probably going to be one of those things. So this primary menu here, as I said before, that's going to link to this here. Okay, so whatever you've called your menu in this first parameter when you register it, is going to be what you output here as part of the theme location or there. Okay, now we refresh that. Okay, there we can see, although my styling's obviously broken, okay, it doesn't match up, there's the, the main menu that's, that's been output there in that particular theme location. So again, you can see it's an unordered list with um, a with some container classes and a bunch of list items which have links okay and they have various different classes so you can make use of those classes to style this list in any way that you want so uh, if I go to my style.css 
and okay so here's my old main menu CSS okay which is not quite applying because because WordPress has na named things a little bit differently to what I did okay but I have some new CSS that I prepared earlier Okay, so I prepared this basically by inspecting the code that uh, that WordPress output for my menu. Okay, so I can see that it's contained within a div with a class of menu main container, then an unordered list, and then list items. Okay, and the list items have been given all of these different posts. So, for example, all of these different classes. Sorry. So, for example, if I click on one of these. The links page, then okay, you can see that one of the classes that's given is the current page item. So I can use that class for styling the currently active link differently to the rest of them. Okay, so while I'm not going to go through and, and rebuild this from scratch right now because it'll probably take up the rest of the, the class, I'll just uh, I'll just Put that code in there now and if I refresh okay so you can see this is with the same I've not modified the HTML code at all all I've done is applied my uh, CSS okay and you can see that you can style that as any kind of menu that you want uh, now I do frequently get asked about how to style this drop down menu it's not not really something that well it's something that I, Kind of expect that you should have done in, in intro to web but I know a lot of people didn't because it's kind of one of the more difficult things um, but rather than demonstrate that if that's something you really want and you may not need it in fact most of you probably won't need it you can probably get away with the top level menu but if you do really want detailed uh, tutorials on how to do that I've got a whole section here on CSS drop down menus uh, with a bunch of links and even a video tutorial on that. So if you do, if you do want to implement one of those drop-down menus um, and you're struggling to do so, I'd start with that, and then I can also help you. Um, I can also help you as you're developing the theme as well, if you like with that. Um, but I'd rather not spend too much time on going through it in class because it's only going to apply to a fraction of people, if any at all. Um, and just a just a quick word on that. Um, while while this is a good way of while this is a good way of structuring a menu that has for somewhere that has a lot of content and a lot of very deep hierarchical content. So this is the kind of menu that I have operating for. Uh, well, that operates in the default menu that I have operating for the tutorial website. Um, before you jump in and start to do something like that, I'd suggest think about your content first. Um, if, I, I doubt you will see many portfolios that have really deep links like this. They probably have a bunch of top level menus that just link to different categories of, of work that they have. The other thing you've got to remember about this type of menu is that it doesn't work very well in a touch context because touch, because touch devices don't really handle hover events very well, if at all, uh, depending on the device. So there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, I often see people try to implement these just because it's perceived to be kind of difficult and it looks cool, but um, I'd really think twice before doing that and think about the type of content you have and if you really need it. And I would suggest that in most cases you probably don't. Um, but having said that, if you do want to do it, there's uh, links to tutorials here, and I can also help you out with it as well. Um, so just before I finish with custom menus, uh, let's go back and so I'll show you the multiple menu locations thing you can do. So we can have secondary menu. 
So you may have a primary navigation up the top and then a secondary navigation somewhere else down the side or underneath it. So this is how you do register different, different theme locations for outputting menus. Okay, if I refresh this now, I can see that it's now telling me that it supports two menus. And so essentially what you're doing here is you're mapping a menu location to a particular menu itself. So if I, I could output this other menu anywhere else I want, okay, all I would do is I would change this here from primary menu to secondary <coughs> menu. I could output that in my footer or my sidebar or wherever else if I wanted. Um, but the point is that I could, if I decide to reassign a different menu to that location later because I've got theme locations and I've got menus and I map them to each other again, I don't have to go back and modify the code. So I might decide later on that actually I want to output what I've called my sidebar menu in, in the header instead. And so I could save it like that. Okay, and now I can refresh. All right, and it's output the sidebar menu in the header location instead. Now you notice that it has broken my styles again, and that's because Part of the part of the class structure that it gives you is uh, the name of the menu itself in the classes. So just keep note of that when you're trying to style the custom menus that you output as well. Okay, so I'll set that back. But I would say most of the time, especially with a portfolio website, you probably only need one menu with top level functionality. Um, now I should just quickly add to that, uh, at the moment our, our menu is only outputting, uh, outputting pages, um, but I can also output custom links, so I don't actually have, let me just make some of these a bit smaller. So I can actually output, as I said before, a custom link here. So this is an easy way to create a link, uh, a home link as part of your menu. So I can put the label home here and then I can essentially just put the address of my website back in here. Okay, and add that to the menu, drag that up to the top, save. Okay, and there's my home menu there. All right, I click that, and there's you can see now that I've I've rearranged the menu, the child menus. You can see that that's how they're working now as well. Uh, but also, which is possibly going to be more relevant to your portfolio, is outputting categories of posts. Because the way I'm the way I imagine most people will structure their content is you'll have a bunch of portfolio items, which will be in different categories. So let's say you have photography category, and you have a graphic design category, and then you might have a, a, a video category, uh, you might have a programming category. So you've got all these different categories where the types of content in these posts might lend themselves to different types of layouts. And so rather than creating pages for them, I mean you could, I'm not, not saying that you necessarily have to do it in any specific way, but what you can do is you can have every single every single uh, portfolio item as a post but then categorize them differently and then you can have menu items as categories so that when you click on them it just shows you the post from that category. So at the moment we don't have any categories set up except for the default uncategorized one. Okay so let's I will just show you quickly how to do that. So if I go to any of these posts and I go and edit one. Okay, you can see on the right here there's a section called categories. And this is how this is how incidentally all of my tutorial posts are organized. Okay, so so in my in my WordPress site, okay, all of these are posts. I just put them in different categories. And I have parent categories subject and then I have subcategories for things like tutorials, lectures, etc, etc, and then further subcategories for each of the different weeks. 
Okay, but if I was if I was to look at the the post section for my website, which I can do. Okay, you'll notice that I have. Okay, they're all just posts. They all just appear, but they happen to be in different categories, and it's just the fact that I have a menu which outputs the categories that I tell it to that allows the user to click on that link and it will just output the post from the different categories. So I'll try and demonstrate that with this example content in here. You have two ways of creating categories. You can either create them through the categories menu here, which is good if you already know at the beginning what kind of categories you're going to have. So again, let's just say I create one Let's just say I have those categories that I mentioned before, photography. Okay, so when I'm creating a category this way, I have a few things. I have the name, okay, and I have the slug. Now, the slug is the thing that will appear uh, as part of the URL if you have it set like that. So, again, this is similar before to when we're having menus. I could have Okay, I could have the name as a nice name with capitals and, and spaces and things, but I still need a version of that name, which is usually lower class, but definitely all one word. So if I had multiple words, you'd hyphenate it, that kind of thing. Okay, so this, the, the way that it appears to users, and then it's the way that it's referred to in code. So the slug is the way that's referred to in code. I can have uh, parent categories if I want. I can give it a description if I want, but now I'll just add that new category. Okay, let's add another one. So this is a good example of the difference between the name and the slug. Okay, so the slug, as it says here, it has to be URL friendly. You generally don't want spaces appearing in your URL, so I'll create the slug and I'll call it graphic hyphen design. And let's have another one called videos. Okay, so there I've got a few uh, I've got a few categories created. Now when I go back to my posts, if I edit any of these posts, okay, I can see that these are the categories here, and so I can say, well, let's put this one in the graphic design category, and then I can update that. And I could also, uh, you can also do things like, let's say I want to edit a bunch of these, and let's say I want to put all three of these posts in a particular category, then I can select these and go up to bulk actions and edit, and then apply, okay, and I can tell all of these to go in, let's say the photography category. Okay, so that's nice because it can get tedious doing it one by one. And let's say I go, uh, I'll do a couple more. Let's say these ones are video. Even though they're not, we'll just say they are. And let's just say I have, let's just say I'm creating a new post. Okay, so let's create a new post here. Um, and let's say, let's call this my first post. Okay, so let's say I have a category called programming. And okay, and I have some sort of content. And I'm creating the post, and I realize I don't have a category for programming. So I could save this a draft, go back to my categories, create that category, come back, and then select it. But I can also add a new category directly from here as well. So I can go add new category, and let's call this programming. And if I want to, I can select the parent category, and then add new category, and I can select that as well. Okay, and you can have you can have a post belong to multiple categories. So you might have a project, you might have a big project where 
you worked on uh, a bunch of things. Maybe you did the sound and you also did the graphic design. So you'd like that post to actually appear under your sound section and also under your graphic design section. So there's nothing to stop you from adding uh, multiple multiple categories for um, for a particular post. So I could say here, oh, and I also did. Okay, and then we'd publish that. Okay, and I guess while I'm here, I should just mention your publishing options. You can uh, you can actually create posts without publishing them by saving them to be a draft. So what I've done for the tutorial site this semester is I already have a bunch of content from last year, which is already there. So I've set them all back to drafts, and each week I'm just setting them to be republished again so that they're output week by week. So you can do that as well. You can you can create all of your content and if you're not ready to release it yet because you're still working on it, you can keep it saved as a draft and when it's finally ready you can come back and set it to be published. Okay, so now what we can do is go back to our menus and instead of In fact, I'll just delete this menu and start again. So let's create my main menu. And let's go. Uh, okay, let's create a new menu called uh, main again. Okay, so I'm recreating my main menu. This time, I don't want to list pages necessarily, but I want to list the different categories of my posts. So I'm going to add all of these. And then I also still want that link to my home page as well. So I'll add that back in. All right, and save that and make it so it outputs in my primary menu area okay and okay so now my home page still by default lists all of my posts in reverse chronological order okay but now you can see that I've got these categories here. So if I click on the photography one, okay, they're all the posts that I put in the photography category. Uh, if I click on the programming one, there's the one post I put in the programming category. But I should also see that post turn up if I click on the graphic design category because it's in both of those. Okay, so you've got really powerful ways of putting particular project in multiple different categories if it's relevant to it. So that's probably the most common way that, that people will end up structuring their menus and their posts for a portfolio. And let's see. And while I might leave it until next week to get into it, um, there's a part down here about category templates. So what you can actually do then is if you have, let's say you have, uh, let's say you have a programming category and you have a photography category. The programming category is going to contain a bunch of text, a bunch of code snippets. The layout's probably not going to be con conducive to the same layout that you would use for your photography one. So what we'll start to look at is how you can actually create different layout templates for different categories so that if you have your photography category or your graphic design category, you could lay them out as a nice gallery. Whereas if you had your, uh, your programming or maybe your writing, your creative writing category, you could lay them out more as traditional text-based posts. So there's, there's probably not enough time to get into that this week, but there's, there's links to that there if you want to start looking at that beforehand. And then there's also links to the WordPress um, body class which allows you to um, output a bunch of classes which allow you to specifically target different postal categories. But again, we'll get into that more next week, but it's there if you want to look at it beforehand. But 
what I do want to mention uh, as the last thing, or a couple of last things, is uh, the first one, I haven't actually written any notes on it here, but I can still demonstrate. So you'll notice that, as I said, the way that WordPress figures out what content to display is via the URL. So you notice now that we click on a category and then it says, okay, give me the category with the category ID of six. So it goes to the database, gets every post that's got a category ID of six and it outputs all of those posts. Now, ultimately, ultimately having your URL look like this is a, not particularly pretty, and B, it's not uh, the best. Uh, it's not the best way to uh, get a search engine to index your site. So what we can actually do is change the way that the URL is output so that it looks more user friendly, or it, it's more more obvious as to what the content of the page is going to be. So we can do that by going into the settings menu on our WordPress backend and down to a section here called permalinks. And actually, I'll just jump back quickly to a post just to show you that anytime, anytime you create a post, it will tell you exactly here what the link to that post is going to be. So you can see there's the P equals 96, for example. And it's, it calls these permalinks. So the link to any particular piece of content, how, how, do you, how do you want that to output? So if we go to settings and permalinks, we can actually change how that outputs. And it has a few different options. Okay, there's, um, you could output it based on the date and the name, things like that, for example. A common, common one to do would be uh, to output based on the post name. If I look at my tutorial blog, you'll notice that the way I actually uh, have it doing it is to output um, the categories and then the uh, post name itself. So if I go to a particular post there. Okay, so, well actually it's just outputting, outputting the categories. No, sorry, it is outputting the post name as well. So it's outputting the, the topmost category, tab B216 and then uh, the name of the post itself. So this permalink section is where you can change that and if you click on this number of tags are available link, it will show you the different kind of things that you can output. So these are all the things you can do here, okay? So you get output as part of the URL, the year, the month, a whole bunch of date stuff. Um, in, in terms of mine, the way I usually like to do it is do the category and the post name. And for, so WordPress can understand it, you put the, uh, the percentage um, characters around it. So if, for example, I make my custom structure category slash post name, then the URL will change from question mark P equals a number to the category name forward slash and then the name of the post. Okay, so I'll save that. Now, sometimes it will give you an error here where it says it couldn't, um, it needed to write to a .ht access file, but it couldn't do it. Um, if it does that, so the .ht access file, the file that just lives uh, in the in the root folder of your web server. So it's, it's literally full stop ht access with no file extension. It's a hidden file, so if you can't see it, make sure you turn on view hidden files. Then if it's not there, you can just create it yourself. But all you really need to do is copy and paste the text that it gives you into that file to make it work uh, if it doesn't already. Um, but again, that's something I can help you with if you run into that trouble. But just letting you know that that's something that may happen. Really. So now that I've done that, okay, I'll, let's say I'll, I'll click on one of these categories again, say click on graphic design, okay, and now my URL is a lot more human friendly. So I can see, I can now essentially figure out where my where I'm navigating in the site by looking at the URL. So I get the, um, so I get uh, 
URL and then the category and then the graphic design and then if I click on any of these individual posts okay I get the name of the post itself and you can see it's it's sanitizing the name of the post so that it adds hyphens instead of spaces so that's all nice and URL friendly like that as well um, okay very last thing for this week is Okay, so the last thing I'll go over this week is creating a static front page. So, as we can see, the default way that the front page works is to output all of your posts, okay? which is fine for a blog, but for a portfolio, maybe you don't want that. For a portfolio, maybe you'd rather have your home page as an about me page, it's lists, maybe it could be like a, a brief resume page maybe you want to give an overview of what kind of content is in your portfolio who knows maybe you want to have maybe you do want to have your home page as a blog because as part of your portfolio or as part of your field of work you like to you like to write about stuff a lot um, but you can set a particular you can set a specific page to be the home page and then have your blog as a separate category entirely if you want so the way that we do that is quite simple. We go to uh, under settings. There's a section called uh, reading. Okay, and here we can specify what the front front page displays. And so by default, you can see it displays your latest posts. But we can instead say we want it to display one of our static front pages. Uh, so let's just say I want it to display that page, sample page, whatever happens to be on that. And then if I want another section of my site which still does list all of my posts, then I can uh, select a different page for that as well. So I'll I'll leave that blank for now and then I'll come back to that in a moment and if I say that okay and I come back to my site all right and you can see now if I load up my home page it's not showing me the list of it's not showing me the list of my latest posts it's showing me the page that I've told it to show so Probably what you'd more likely do would be you'd go and create a page and you'd go new page, call it home page or whatever, don't call it home page. Okay. Publish that. And then if I wanted to still have a blog section, then I could create another page, which I called blog. Okay, and I'll leave that blank because that's gonna be replaced with my most recent post anyway. So I've created two new pages here, a home page and a blog page, and I'll go back to my settings and reading, and I'll set the front page to be home page, and I'll set the post page to be and I'll save those changes and then obviously I'm going to want to add this blog page to my to my menu somewhere so that I can still access it so I'm going to go back to my appearance and menus and I'll select the blog page add that to the menu and I'll get it just underneath home Okay. All right. So now there's my home page. So whatever content I want to go on the home page, if that was an about me section, I'd just put it in that page there. And anytime I edit it, it would changes would obviously show up on the home page. Now, hopefully, if I click on blog, this now shows my recent posts. So what used to show up on my home page. So if I if I wanted to if I wanted to still have a blog but not have it on the home page, and that's the way I could do it. 
Okay, and then as well, I've still got all of my categories. Now, another thing you might end up wanting to do is go, well, okay, I want, I want to have a blog, but I don't want it containing any of the other content that's in these categories here. So there's a very simple answer to that, and that is, instead of having a blog page, okay, I would just get rid of this, and I would have... Save that. Okay, I'll go add new. And I would just create a category called blog. Okay, and anytime I create a blog post, I would just add it to that category. All right, and let's clone that. All right, so this is, you can see where this is this is useful using the the duplicate post. If I know I want another blog post, I can just duplicate the last one and it will already have all the categories set up for me. Uh, so I'll publish that one. And make sure in my menu that I add the blog category. Save that. Okay, so now I have a blog which is completely separate to uh, oh, uh, ah, sorry, my bad. That's conflicting. I just have to turn off that. Okay, so we'll have no specific posts page. Say that for this one. Sorry, I need to add a page again instead of the category. So, this should be the blog category, not the blog page. Alright, again. Okay, so now I have my home page, which is a static home page. I can put anything I want on there. I have all of the categories for my different sorts of portfolio items. And then I have a separate category for anything that I legitimately want to be a blog post, which I just add to a category called blog, and they get there as well. Okay, so that was, that's a good place to stop for this week. As I said, next week we'll look at how, how we can uh, style different sections, different categories of the website differently or even different post types uh, so that the way that your content is laid out is really appropriate to what that content is, particularly in terms of whether it's very visual or whether it's kind of text-based. Uh, okay, are there any questions about anything that I've gone over today? No? Okay. <laughs>